So yesterday we were blessed uh, to hear from uh, Reverend Dennis Tongoy. Um, and uh, Reverend Dennis Tongoy um, is the route uh, to fruit master trainer. He holds a doctorate in missiology from the University of South Africa. He's also the founding international director emeritus of CMS Africa. He coordinated Samaritan Strategy Africa, a movement of over 600 tra trainers on biblical worldview and holistic discipleship in more than 40 countries in Africa. So Dennis has engaged with several community leaders in community leadership initiatives, among them a board chair of Carl Carlisle College, general secretary of Christians for a Just Society, mobilized and facilitated Christian professionals in addressing issues of poor um, governance and corruption. Dennis was National Director of the Navigators Kenya from 1995 to 2000. Um, he, led a team of, he led a team that expanded the ministry in Kenya beyond Nairobi to Mombasa, Kisumu, Homa Bay, Eldoret, Machakos, Kitui, and Embu. He also helped, helped establish the Economic Project Trust Fund, EPTF Microenterprise Program for the Navigator Leaders. He consolidated the national leadership uh, team, developed a 10-year vision before successfully transitioned leadership. Uh, Dennis uh, served as the business leadership manager for the executive MBA program run by the Copenhagen Business School in collaboration with Mount Kenya uh, University. Um, so over 110 CEOs of Kenyan companies have been mentored through this program. Dennis is a director at Hubble Garden Limited and Agribusiness SME established in 2007, and Bezalel Investment Limited engaging in funding real estate uh, development established in 1901. Um, and he's also made a number of publications. Um, yeah, so um, I'm honored to present to you um, participants, um, our speaker for today, Reverend Dennis Tongoy. Thank you very much, Davis. Um, as you probably heard from my CV, I'm passionate about business. And I was baptized into business, not by accident, but I believe by divine design. And um, I'll be talking today about principles for kingdom businesses. And um, that is also the area in which I did my doctoral studies. And I believe that God has a place for business people, not only in scripture, but in contemporary society. So I trust most of you were here yesterday, but let us pray as we begin this session. Father, we thank you that you are the creator, the originator, the first cause of all things that we see here, and the things that are unseen, and things that we don't even know. We thank you that we're not here by accident, but we're here by divine design. And we thank you that it's you who is able to continually open our eyes on a daily basis to begin to see the bigness of the eternal purposes for each of us individually. And also together collectively as members of your body and ultimately in eternity as we restore your rule over all creation. I pray that Lord, as we engage this afternoon, you may speak to our hearts and encourage us to be faithful to what you've called us to be, your servants. In Jesus' name I pray. So, yesterday we began looking a bit about the dualistic mindset. And uh, today I'll be continuing on to basically focus on the area of business. Business and enterprise form the institution that is designed to create and sustain wealth for a just society. In the same way, government is designed to create and sustain an organized society, and the family is designed to create and sustain well-organized societies. And of course, you see all this founded and rooted in Genesis chapter one, because government begins with self-government. When Adam and Eve were told not to touch the fruit of the tree, the whole idea was are they able to be self-controlled governing themselves? 
and all governments begin with the self and then each community engaging in governing itself. You cannot govern a, a country from a national perspective unless individuals are self-governing. Families are designed to pass on values and sustain well-adjusted individuals. But in order to fulfill the creation mandate, businesses have been, is, is, is one of the vehicles that God has chosen. Now, there are four relationships that business has to mission. And in my diagram there, I show one axis where we see uh, business and the other axis where we see mission. The first quadruple there is business as business, which is driven by profit ma maximization as its only goal. The reason why most people do not, or most Christians feel shy or embarrassed about business or treat it as dirty is because this is the only model of business they have been exposed to. In 2008, when the financial markets crashed globally, or let me put it this way, crashed in the West because Africa was not really impacted as much, we find that there was tremendous discussions as to how can we change business to make it ethical. Because in profit maximization, the only thing that matters is profit for their shareholders and nobody else. The Q2 there on my diagram is what I call mission as business. There is people who choose to carry out acts of philanthropy, but supported by those who make the money in business. This model presupposes that people make money and then give it to those who go and spend the money. Now, many Western NGOs or charities are based on this model. Even the, even the UN itself is based on this model. Problems exist in one part of the world, give us money to go and solve the problems. The only danger with this particular model is when the problems are solved, the business winds up. And therefore people who work in those, business, uh, those, those agencies do not want to solve the problems because then they'll be out of a job. Another thing is that it can be very, very inefficient because sometimes as much as 80% of the money given to these institutions goes to overheads and doesn't actually reach the beneficiaries at the end. The third quadrant is what I call mission as mission. And this is those aspects of our community which will never be sustainable and are not designed to be sustainable. For example, if you go to a children's home, the children who are beneficiaries of that home cannot repay the owner. I've actually had pastors in churches tell me they do not like children's ministries because children don't give tithes. Yet it is more strategic to invest in children than it is to try and repair adults who have gone astray. So mission as mission is critical engagement in society that requires to be funded from other places. But what I'll be talking about today is what I call business as mission. That is making profit for the common good. You're making, you're making surplus, creating surplus for the common good. And as I said, business is rooted in the, in the creation mandate, the stewardship mandate. When God told Adam and Eve, he blessed them and told them to be fruitful and to multiply, to increase in numbers. He told them to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. And the most effective way of multiplying and creating additional wealth is through business. Governments use resources, they don't create resources. But businesses create new resources. They increase the frontiers, they, increase, they take new ideas and put them to work for the benefit of mankind. So business is very critical even to fulfill the stewardship mandate. Because as you're called to increase and multiply, it means you must create surplus resources so that every person gets an opportunity to enjoy this. In the Old Testament, we're all familiar with Proverbs 31, 
that talks about the godly wife. And you find that she inspects a field, she buys it, she's engaged in business, and she's been given autonomy by her husband to make decisions. She earns money, which she uses to plant a vineyard. She works hard, but she does not do this wastefully. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. She works very, very hard. Now this story tells us a number of things. First of all, it's a, there's a woman who is in business. And the creation mandate was given to Adam and Eve, not to Adam alone. It was man, male and female, given the mandate to take care of God's creation and to increase and multiply. Now, in this particular story, you're familiar with the fact that she takes care of her maid servants, she takes care of the poor, she takes care of the needy. You're also familiar with the fact that her husband sits at the gate. Now, some have not understood what that means. Some people have thought that it's a typical African way where the women work and the men sit around. But that's not the biblical understanding of that passage in Proverbs 31. Sitting at the gate was sitting at the place of authority and decision-making and governance. When Boaz wanted to buy the land from Naomi in the book of, of Ruth, he went to the city gates, and that's where he exchanged his sandal as a covenant sign of buying or taking Naomi's property. So this woman is playing a very, very critical role in society, and her husband is playing an even, even more significant role because when she buys the land, it is a husband who signs the title deed, as it were. So the Bible does not in any way discount business in African context, as opposed to the Jewish context of the Middle East, or what I call the Western context of today. We have been caused to think that business is something you do privately, or it's something you don't talk about, or it is something you don't share with others. But part of this is because in the Jewish culture, it was common for everybody to be involved in part of the economy. The word economy, or it calls nomos in the Greek, comes from household management. Every household had a business enterprise in which it was involved. And to be a Jew is to be in business. But modern secularized, mechanistic worldview, and what I talked about yesterday, is very dualistic. It divides life into different segments and makes some segments more important than others. And part of it is as a result of the Industrial Revolution in the West, which mechanized society so that everybody played a specialized role in order to increase productivity. But that's not how God designed us. God designed us to be part of a community where we each play our different roles, complementing one another as we build a greater economy. And why do we need to build a greater economy? It's because, just by simple logic, if God has called us to multiply, then if I have one plate and I get married to my wife, we can either share that one plate or get another plate for her to eat from. And if God blesses us with children, we can either share the two plates or create a third plate. And since we're told to multiply, not to add, God assumes we'll have at least three children because one is not multiplication, two is addition, three is multiplication. Therefore, by the time I have three children, I should have at least five plates to feed those three children. And then because the biblical economy was what Michael Schluter calls a three-generational economy, where three generations stay together in one home, I have responsibility for my aging parents and assume they're both alive. So any adult who is working needs to have the capacity to be able to support two aging parents and at least three children. So multiplication has to be the case. We do not just um, add, but we multiply. And business is one way in which we're able to multiply resources. See, God has a plan for all humanity. What I call the great mandate in Genesis chapter one, we read about that. In verse 22, we said, God bless them. And then the Great Commission, we see God continue to bless them. He says this mandate in Genesis 12, when he tells 
Abraham, that he has blessed him to be a blessing. And so when you see every human being as blessed, then blessed to be a blessing, then you ask yourself, what does it mean to be blessed? To be, to, to be blessed is to be somebody who, who causes things to flourish and to thrive, not to die and to wilt. I mean, Jesus gives the mandate in Matthew 28. He says, make disciples of all nations, not in the nations. All the nations are supposed to reflect God's blessing. So wherever God's people are, God expects that community to be blessed, that community to flourish. The Bible tells us that creation itself groans, awaiting for the revelation of the sons of God. The creation, because of the fallen uh, of the fall, is crying and says, we are the people who are called by God's name to come in and see how God can be glorified through creation flourishing. So right in the book of Genesis, we see work as sacred. God was a worker, and work was not given to mankind because he had sinned and fallen, but work was given to mankind as a reflection of his nature of being made in God's image. And work is very central to the mission of the church. And in fact, what the church should be asking ourselves is not how many people are tithing, but how many people are working. We tend to focus on the product of work, which is a tithe, rather than the activity of work. And churches should be central, or Christians should be central, at discussing how people are doing in their jobs. That's really the biblical word for fellowship. Koinonia means sharing together material things. Fellowship is not having Bible study or drinking tea together or having choruses sung. It's asking me, how are you doing today and how is your business? Koinonia. But most discussions about work tend to gravitate towards ethics. Are you being corrupt or not being corrupt? And although this is important, this doesn't capture God's intention for work in the Bible. God's intention for work had three dimensions. The instrumental aspect of the work, the relational aspect of the work, and the ontological aspect of the work. Let me unpack this for us. Darrell Cousin, I just quoted, says, the reduction of work to the instrumental aspect focuses on the economic, spiritual, social, or existential outputs. It tends to humanize human life and makes itself an object to be achieved. Persons become cut off from themselves and their lives. When you focus only on the instrumental aspect of life, what do I mean by the instrumental aspect of, of, of work? Sorry. Let me take an example. When I tell you, when you have work and you're going out there to, to work in the garden, your purpose is to dig and plant crops. That is the instrumental aspect of work. It is to achieve a certain end. Unfortunately, this has become the only measure of our understanding of work. It what is the output that we have. The Bible talks about two other dimensions. As you're digging that garden, you are relating to somebody else. You're talking to them, you're eating with them, you're praying with them. So as, as in addition to having a well-tended garden, you now have relationships that have been developed as a result of being at work. Now, most of us will spend two thirds of our life at work. And if work is only a means of production, then we're very, very impoverished. But if work becomes a place that helps us to establish relationships that advance God's kingdom, then we see work as having more purpose than just producing results. There's also what we call the ontological uh, purpose of work. That is the eternal or, um, of, of, uh, purpose of work. God has a purpose for every work that is redemptive. Because of the fall, work became uh, uh, because of the fall, work became difficult. And so those of us who are in Christ and have the, have, have, have the curse of, of the fall that has been paid for by Christ, when we come into a place of work, we're coming in as redemptive agents. Let me give you a case study. And this case study is a company which I began some years ago. I was very, very 
um, angry about how Uber was coming into Africa and exploiting drivers who are not making any money. So some friends of mine, one of, one of the friends was from, from uh, Kigali in uh, Rwanda, we formed this company called Phone Taxi. And we began to operate in the market so that our presence would allow us to pay drivers fairly. Now it was a very, very difficult journey trying to fight against Uber, which had very, very deep pockets. And we began to discover that in that industry, there are three types of people. Those who owned the cars, but did not drive them. Those who drove the cars, but did not own them. And those who owned them and drove them. Now, Uber kept cutting the prices of the per kilometer until it forced drivers to spend more and more hours every day in order to same, make the same amount of money. So I, by the grace of God, was able to round up several drivers, about 500 drivers, and we lobbied the government of Kenya. And we actually met many, many times with the uh, Ministry of Transport until we culminated in an agreement between the drivers, car, car owners, and, and taxi drivers, and, 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 and uh, taxi app drivers, that there will be no more price reductions as a form of marketing. And I'm sure most of you have not noticed that, but Uber and other people never talk about price reduction again in this country. So what happened? In this business, there was an instrumental aspect of the business, driving people around. But there's also the relational aspect. During that time, I got to know over 500 drivers and one of my best buddies was a friend called Mohammed, a Muslim. If I pick up a call right now and I called, and I called him and I could hear him online, he'd say, Good afternoon, Reverend. He's my good best friend. He's not come to know Jesus yet, but he respects Christ because of me. And he saw my fight for justice and righteousness. Now, when it comes to as a business, because we were fighting against a very, very big financial giant, I lost a lot of money. I lost over 4,000, almost 5,000 US dollars, uh, no, 500,000 US dollars of my own money. I never recovered that money, but I changed and transformed the entire industry by being present. So business is not just what you do to achieve end results. It's about the relationships that you create during that time. And it's about the eternal impact, how you become salt and light. And yesterday we talked a bit about this, just the dualistic worldview. God has called us to be agents of righteousness and justice, to bring about his kingdom uh, uh, results. Now, for most people, when you start in business, you assume you're going to become an overnight success. My description of a successful business person is not one who, who has succeeded many times, but one who has failed many times and stood up. And sometimes Christians begin business, and we'll be, we'll be talking about this as we go along, and when they fail, they assume God has not called them into business. Or Christians who are in business go through difficult times and they wonder why is God allowing my business to fail? Michael Jordan says he's missed more than 9,000 shots in his career. He's lost more than 300 games. 26 uh, times he's been trusted to take the winning shot and missed. He's failed over and over again in his life. That's why he's a success. And to me, a successful business person is not one who tries their first venture and, and makes it into financial or fame, but it's one who has a resilience to recognize that God has given them a perseverance to meet a specific need in society. And as they persevere in meeting that need, God gives them the capacity to turn it into profit. You're aware of the saying about Thomas Edison. He knew 1,000 ways in which making a light does not work. So business is a calling, and not everybody is called to business. When I say call to business, you can be a business owner who creates employment for other people. That's what I'm talking about. Or you can work in a business. Now, some of us are business owners. Some of us work in a business. And not all are business owners because it takes a great perseverance 
and capacity to become a job creator. But all of us are called to be priests in the marketplace. One danger we find of, our, of our, the impacts of dualism we discussed yesterday was that we somehow think that God's kingdom is a kingdom with priests. God never intended Israel to be a kingdom with priests. He called them a kingdom of priests. And it's important to real, realize that for us in Christ, there's what we call the doctrine of the principle of all, uh, the, the, the priesthood of all believers. When God raised Israel, he said, you'll be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you have to speak to the Israelites. What does this mean? Everybody in Israel was to be a priest and they were to be set apart, called as a holy nation. We in the church today, in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, are similarly to be a kingdom of priests. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare the presence of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So when people tell me I've been called from business to go into the ministry, they are actually negating God's understanding of what he's called all of us to do. God has chosen those of us who are in Christ. All of us are a royal priesthood. All of us are a holy nation. All of us are a special possession. And for those of us who are in the marketplace, it's important to realize that all of us are called. And you need to have a conviction of why God has called you to that specific role in the marketplace. Now, this does not negate the role of those who have special roles within, the, within the, 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 the priesthood of believers. The Bible says he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of saints for the work of ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ. There are some who are going to be put aside with special roles. Some are going to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists. So within the, within, the, within the kingdom of God, there are those who are going to be given special roles who have a specific objective and a goal just to equip the saints. And yesterday I discussed this with you about football match. I am an ordained church minister. I'm not saying church ministry is of any less value. All I'm saying it is not the only part of the kingdom. Because the role of the coach is to train the team. When the team keeps losing matches, the coach gets fired, not the goalkeeper. So the work of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers is absolutely critical and essential, but it is not the ministry. The ministry is to, to equip the saints for work of ministry. And what does work of ministry mean? Service. My success is where the people are ministering to become servants of God, where God has called them. My success is not how tired and worn out I am by being a preacher or by being a Bible study group leader. My success is seeing those who have trained and equipped serving God's kingdom out there in the, in the marketplace. That is success. I chose this um, in, um, translation here because some translations have actually uh, not used the word some. Again, if you look at the New Living Translation, it says, now these are the gifts uh, Christ gave to the church the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, evangelists, the responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So the measure of success is God's people serving, not in the church building as ushers and choir masters and all those things, but serving in the marketplace as priests, setting up altars for God, wherever God has placed them. The church that I have been attending all since cathedral until we were, by God's grace and design, not able to, to, to go together, to join together, we would have as many as 6,000 people gathered for worship in several services on a Sunday. How many altars did we have? How many priests did we have? Maybe 15 priests. But on Monday, all those 6,000 people are scattered in the marketplace, filled with the Holy Spirit like Bezalel was, to raise up altars for the kingdom of God where God has placed them, to pull down altars and raise up, and raise up, uh, and raise up the banner of Christ. 
So if we were to see the success of those who are in so-called full-time ministry or set apart with special roles, it is not how busy they are, but it is how effective we are in the marketplace. So the question we have, are there business, Christian businesses or are Christians in business? And I discussed this yesterday. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul says, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. All of us are called. Some of us are given roles to equip the others, but all of us are priests. And wherever God places us, he doesn't, he's not saying that this business is better than another business. And he's asking you to start a Christian business. He's asking you to show his love where his show is placed to you. He's asking you to have a pure heart where it's placed to you. He's asking you to have a good conscience and a sincere faith. And if people, Christians in the marketplace, saw themselves not as competing, but as complementing one another in the marketplace, then we look out for each other and look for ways of collaborating so that we can continue to serve those whom God has brought away. There is a difference though between kingdom businesses and other businesses or businesses which are kingdom, advancing God's kingdom and others which are not. Paul says in Ephesians 4 verse 28, he who has been stealing must steal no longer but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Unfortunately, the world views business as extractive. When I say extractive, it is how do I take from others and bring into my own resources. Stealing is part of Satan's paradigm with God of this world. And most people, business as business, has often seen itself as what can I take with the, with the least price possible? But Paul says we must stop stealing. But that's not where the story ends. He says we must start working. So a kingdom business is not just one which does not steal. We're saying ethically we don't bribe, we don't we pay, we don't we, we, we don't do X, Y, Z. That's not, not what makes a business a Christian business or a kingdom business. A kingdom business is one that creates work. And not only that, it's one that actually begins to give back to society. Let me contrast these two. We have two types of businesses. Transformative kingdom business model differs from the world's business. The world views business as extractive, taking that which belongs to another. A thief basically takes that which belongs to somebody else. But what Paul is saying here, stop stealing. When I say stop stealing, means when you're paid for a product or a service or knowledge, make sure you're given value to those who are consumers. Extractive models always end up with loss of jobs because when corruption takes place, people lose employment. I've always asked people a question. I know because of this COVID issue, there's been some people who have a very diverse views of my good friend, Bill Gates. But I've never heard somebody call Bill Gates a filthy rich man. Because in his creation of wealth, becoming a billionaire, he made very many people become millionaires. So when you're creating wealth, you actually create employment. And we multiply and we spread, the, we grow the economy. Unfortunately, the extractive model was built on self-interest and a false premise by people, economists such as Adam Smith, who assumed that business should be driven by greed and fear. But we're saying no, businesses can actually be driven with love and service. We can share with others through paying taxes. We can pay our taxes. We can help the, 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 the earth and the community grow and become better. Instead of exploiting, we can actually become empowering. So yesterday I talked a bit about this in one of the answers, is how then do we relate as kingdom people to wealth? And I'm going to talk about four relationships that Paul uh, 
uh, talked about in First Timothy in how we relate to wealth. Profit is a biblical term. Wealth creation is mandated in Genesis chapter 1. And wealth creation is essential if you're going to fulfill the, the creation mandate. But Paul begins by saying, Godliness, the people, the first way of, 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 of relating to wealth is people who view godliness as a way to become wealthy. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 5 says, These people always cause trouble, their minds are corrupt, they have turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is a way to become wealthy. And unfortunately, for many of us in the church or as Christians, we often put down where our faith as a means to try and get a business. And unfortunately, when that business fails or goes into headwinds, people assume that we are used our godliness as a means to become wealthy. Now, let me give a caveat. Business is very, very challenging. And I have failed in a number of businesses, not because of ethical issues, but because of systemic issues where the context exploits rather than builds up. But Paul is warning us here not to use our godliness as a way to become wealthy. It is not so much our godliness, but our competence. I should relate to somebody in business, not because they are godly, but because they are competent. And because their character warrants me to work with them. And character is not perfection. Perfection assumes that you never make a mistake. But character is authenticity. That I'll share with you when I'm struggling, I'll share with you when I'm down, and together we'll walk the path that God has called us to, to be effective in the business God has placed before us. That's why Paul says, those who are to become leaders must be of tested character. He says, not be a heavy drinker, not violent, not a lover of money. What does this mean? It means we don't find our identity in how much money we have or don't have. Some people are constantly talking about how much money they don't have. That means your identity is placed in your money. Or some people think the money they have is what defines them. No, no, no. I am defined as a child of God. I am defined not by my successes or failures. And I've had some significant failures and also some significant successes in the area of business. But they don't define me. My definition is I'm a child of God. Paul said last night, an angel of the Lord, whose I am and whose I, whom, whom I serve, stood before me. I am defined by whose I am and whom I serve, not what I have or what I've achieved. And with that definition, I can go into the world of business or into the marketplace. Whether I fail or succeed doesn't change my identity because God has a purpose for my life. So oftentimes when we go through certain experiences, these are times of testing to find out whether we're going to be honest or dishonest with money. And as we prove ourselves honest with money, God in his grace is able to entrust with us more and more resources. And I believe God is merciful to many of us by keeping, us, keeping money away from us because if he gave it to us, it would destroy us. I've seen young people getting into their parents' big six-liter SUV, driving over the speed limit and basically killing themselves or other people because they did not have the self-control and the character to drive such a powerful car. And God, in his mercy, keeps you away from the power of money because if he entrusted it to you with a dishonest heart, you destroy not only yourself but others. I've also learned that as I work with Christians, is not to put my trust in people, but put my trust in God. When somebody comes to me, however mature they are as a believer, I recognize them as a fallen being up to temptation and up to being able to succumb to the flesh, to the world, and to the devil. So trust in God don't put your trust in people, which means put together systems in your businesses that ensure accountability, 
It ensures systems and structures. I've just been uh, consulting for a group of people where they trusted each other, but there are no systems or structures. When success came, the business almost fell apart because they did not have structures and systems. We need to have systems and structures to mitigate against our fallen human nature. Second group of people he talks about is true godliness and contentment is great wealth. Now, if you have $10 million and you have no contentment, you're truly poor. If you have $1 and you're content, you have great wealth. Because God has given us sufficient for our daily needs. He says, we came with nothing into this world and we can't take anything when we leave. So with food and coverings, clothings, let us be content. And I would say for all of us is that if our pursuit of business or career or even ministry is a cause of lack of contentment with what we have currently, we'll never be satisfied with any amount of multiplication or any amount of resources that God will place before us. So the first question, I'd ask, second question I'd ask is this, are you truly wealthy? Is your heart filled with contentment? And one measure of contentment is thankfulness. Do you get up every morning thanking God for your circumstances and in your circumstances? And I can also share with you many, many situations where I had grave, grave, grave business decisions of significant magnitude that are going to affect many people placed at my table. But I begin the day by saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Because if this particular deal goes through or doesn't go through or fails, I could be greatly shamed. I could be greatly uh, accused of, of um, um, being uh, unethical. But I know, God, you've called me to this. And I trust you. You'll, you'll, you'll cover me and direct me through it. So I begin recognizing that this is God's work. And it's not God working for me in my business. It is God working through me to accomplish his blessing through my business. And once I recognize that, I can relax because it's not my name, but God's name. In business, sometimes as a Christian businessman, when my businesses have failed and I have had many failed businesses, I found it sometimes difficult to come before my brothers who invested in the business. But I realized that Jesus had to go through the same in Philippians chapter two. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to God. And did not count equality a thing to be grasped, but became a servant. So we approach business as service, business as a way to serve others, trusting God to vindicate us. And in God's timing, he will vindicate you. He will not leave you to go to shame. And then Paul addresses those whose goal is to become rich. Now, this is people who set their business goals with the dollar signs at the end. They long to be rich. And Paul says, this places you in great temptation. And anybody can trap you. And you find yourself in many foolish and harmful desires that will actually plunge you into ruin and destruction. Now you might hear this and, and be desperate and say, then how is it possible for Christians to be involved in business? The answer to this is never make your goal in business to be rich. Make your goal in business to serve other people and to meet people's needs. Define the need that God is calling you to meet and let the profit be the validation. And we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. So never set your business goal as being rich. Yes, you need to make money. You need to have a surplus, make a profit. But profit itself is not the goal. The mission has got to be very clear. What it is God has called you to do. And defined in kingdom terms, not in worldly terms. It's very easy to fall into temptation, get trapped, and many foolish and harmful desires when money becomes the end goal of your business or your life. So what is then business as mission? The fourth quadruple, quadruple that we discussed. 
those of us who are called in business recognize that our business is our mission. And this is a venture or a person that seeks to advance God's mission by meeting the needs of individuals and communities through the provision of goods, services, or knowledge in a financially sustainable manner with measurable, positive, social, spiritual, and environmental impact. Somebody has actually called this, we focus on people's needs, we focus on the needs of the planet ahead of profits. So profits do not define our business, but profits, people, and planet are part of our business. And in, in, in case any of you want to read a little bit further on this topic, there is a book that was published about three years ago called Completing Capitalism. And, and it's an amazing book on how it was done by Christian, uh, Christians in a business called the Mars Corporation. And they showed how profits, people, and planets can both be served by a business without one undermining the other. You can actually bless people and renew the planet without compromising prof uh, profits. So you need to define your business, not in just how much profit you make, but how does it impact on the people, both your, your workers, and how does it impact on your customers and the community around. Then Paul comes to those who, are, who have wealth, those who are wealthy. Now, you may find yourself wealthy for various reasons. You could have inherited the wealth. Your business may go through a tremendous time of blessing. Or you may find yourself entrusted with significant amounts of money by others. And Paul says, the first thing is teach those who are rich in this world. That's those who have surplus and choice over the resources, not to be proud. The first thing is to be careful about our hearts. Pride, like I shared yesterday, was what caused Satan to fall from being the chief musician in heaven. And I have observed that humility is a hallmark of all people who have seen that God has entrusted with lots of money. My wife and I are part of a global fellowship of Christian believers who gather every year called a Christian Economic Forum. And these are people who have businesses, some of them employing as many as 40, 50,000 people around the world. And these people have thousands and thousands of dollars coming through their accounts every minute. And my wife and I have observed the one common thing about all of them is their humility. And the book of James talks about humbling ourselves so that God may exalt us, resisting the devil, humbling ourselves. And sometimes those who are such resources, in order for God to keep using them, like the apostle Paul did, there's a thorn in the flesh to keep them humble so they don't trust in their money. It's very dangerous to put trust in your money. And what do I mean by this? is you assume your money is going to answer all your problems. We still need to become dependent on God because Paul says here that trust in money is very unreliable. Now, COVID has taught us about the unreliability of money. Our trust should always be in God. And the second thing there Paul talks about there is enjoying what God has given us. I've seen those whom God has blessed with the resources, but they don't enjoy them. The some feel that by enjoying them, they may appear to be, to be less godly. You're not enjoying what God has given you, but enjoyment is not the same as flaunting your wealth. But bring others, let them share what God has given you. Be a blessing together with them. Let them enjoy God's creation. Share what God has entrusted to you. But remember that what God is calling you to do is to use your money to do good, to be rich in good works, to be always ready to share with others which means you must have a very, very clear agenda of how God is calling you to use that money to be a blessing. Because God called Abraham, he blessed him to be a blessing. And God has entrusted that wealth to you, not for your own sake, but for the sake of being generous to those in need, always ready to share with others, always being generous. Now, when it comes to how do you then fund mission, 
or how do you then deal with money? I shared yesterday and may not have been in this forum because I've been talking to two or three different forums, but I'll just go through this about the four Josephs. Because people keep coming to me and saying, God has called me into ministry, but I don't have any money. Others come to me and say, oh, you're not praying hard enough. You need to fast and pray more. Or this is spiritual warfare. You need to be more and more. And I say, wait a minute. The question is not so much how... My fo- see, sometimes by doing that, our focus tends to be on God's, on the money, rather than on fi- finding out what season of life we're in and what, what uh, God has entrusted or kept away from us in that season. Because it's about God's mission, not about my happiness or satisfaction. God is the one who is on mission. It is he who is accomplishing his redemptive purposes, which were completed in Christ Jesus when he shed his blood on the cross and redeemed all things to himself. And I can tell you for me, in the last four years, by the grace of God, I helped reshape the, the uh, Uber and the, and the, and the mobile, mobile, uh, money, uh, mobile taxi app for this country. I was broke, but I built many relationships. So the goal, the success of my business was not how much money I made, but the impact that I had for eternity and the people I got to present Christ to. So let's look at Joseph. Joseph in the Old Testament had several seasons in his life. There was a season of the pit, and then there was a season of Potiphar's house, and there was a season of prison, and there was a season in the palace. Now in each of these seasons, you observe that God continued to bless Joseph and make him a blessing in each of those seasons. Whether it was in Potiphar's house or in prison, he was always a blessing to other people. His blessingness was not based upon how much resources he had, but it was based upon him seeing himself as a servant of God. So I don't know which season your life is in right now. You may be in a very, very difficult season in prison or in the pit, or God may have entrusted you because of his own purposes to be in the palace today. The second Joseph is Joseph, the father of Jesus. During this COVID era, you are aware and I'm aware of many people who have passed away prematurely or because of this crisis. Joseph, the father of Jesus, is one of those people in scripture who is very rarely heard of or is mentioned very few times, yet he played a very pivotal role in the life of the incarnate God. His life was cut short according to history. He had fulfilled his purpose and he died prematurely. Well, so did Jesus. Jesus died at 33 years of age. He had fulfilled his purpose. It wasn't the length of his service, but the depth of his obedience. It wasn't how long he lived or how much, how long we work, but the level of our aligning ourselves with God's purpose in our generation. And when we are finished, like David, God will call us home because for us, there is a resurrection. This world is not everything. This world is building for the kingdom. The kingdom will be consummated when Christ returns. So not how long you live, but how much you align yourself in obedience to Christ and his call upon your life. The third Joseph is Joseph of Arimathea. The Bible mentions him several times in the Gospels, describing him as a very wealthy person. He was sat in the Sanhedrin, in the gates of the city, where they made decisions. He was a godly man in the midst of a corrupt religious establishment. At Joseph of Arimathea, we're told, when the decision was made to crucify Jesus, he did not cast his vote. But when Jesus was killed, because he had access to the, to the body, he took the body of Jesus and placed it in his own tomb. A number of us are going to have, be entrusted to us significant power and access politically, 
economically, socially. Why is God doing that in your life? And that's a question you should be asking yourself. It's because he wants you to be placed in a position where you shall advance his kingdom, either through being salt and light, ensuring that those who are corrupt around you see you as different, or by providing a resource you have for the advancement of God's kingdom. Maybe it is your home, maybe it is your compound, maybe it's your assets. But Joseph of Arimathea was used in a critical time in history to lend Jesus a tomb for three days before the resurrection. The fourth Joseph is Joseph called Barsabbas or Barnabas in Acts chapter four. Yesterday, somebody asked the question about Jesus calling the disciples to come away from their so-called day jobs, the fishing, and to come and follow him. And like I said, God does call some away from the marketplace of making money so that they can separate themselves to be those who equip the saints. Now, when you look at the saints, uh, the, the early disciples, these were uneducated people, poor people materially, poor people in terms of influence. But God raises up a wealthy person of means called Joseph of Barsabbas, who sells his land and begins to finance the first expansion of the church. Of course, others came to like uh, Sapphira and uh, Ananias, who tried to be deceptive and God judged them. But God may have entrusted to you tremendous resources, either through inheritance or through significant success of your businesses, and is calling you to seek his mind as how to use those resources to advance his kingdom. I've been in a discussion with a friend of mine who worked for the Aga Khan. The Aga Khan, the sect of the Islamic uh, faith, has been the most ridiculed, was the most ridiculed aspect of that faith of, of Islam. But through the Aga Khan, they have learned to become in every country some of the richest and wealthiest people running businesses that cut across every sector, but also running charities that bless people in every sector, from hospitals to schools, to children's homes, to old people's homes, because they don't view money as an end in itself. And I long for the day when Christians will stop seeing money as that which belongs to me and come together and say, now that God has given me these resources, how are we going to come together to significantly impact the kingdom of God? There's mission as mission enterprises. For example, those who translate the Bible. If they don't have money to translate the Bible, how will people hear of the gospel in their own language? There are those who minister to children or to the youth or those who, in the navigator context, are working amongst the university students who can't pay them. How are we going to affect the next generation unless somebody writes that bill? And it's my prayer, even as I think about um, the navigator ministry, that those of us who are my generation and whom God has blessed with the resources will sense a sense of burden, not to give a little bit of what we have to the ministry, but to have a significant strategy of how we entrust resources to God's work. Some of you are aware of a project my wife did to give a house to Auntie Sarah. God has provided that house. Why don't we have people with a vision to empower those whom God has set apart as for the, for the, for, for the special roles so I do not know which Joseph you are or which season you are of life, but each one of you is represented, is represented in these four Josephs. And the marketplace is a place where God wants us to live out that faith. So when Jesus told us to pray, the kingdom come, the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is how you can pray that prayer. You're a doctor not for money, but for Jesus and for the health in the community. You're a lawyer, not for money, but for Jesus and for justice in society. You're an engineer, not for money, but for Jesus and for the fight against the ravages of natural evil. You're an artist, not for money, but for Jesus and the advancement of beauty in the world. You're a businessman, not for self-aggrandizement, but for Jesus and for economic sufficiency of society. So those of you who are in business, God is calling us 
to be not just instrumental, seeing results, but also relational, but also ontological, having a clear purpose for our business. In the garden, God placed mankind in three relationships. In fellowship with himself, God was the owner of all creation and in stewardship of creation given to man. And this is what we need to restore. God is the owner of all is entrusted to you. You are working in fellowship with God and you have stewardship of what God has entrusted to you. And in this way, we begin to see shalom or God's peace and God's uh, harmony that he intends for his disciples. So sin is brokenness and poverty is brokenness. Poverty is not lack of money. Poverty is broken relationships. So we who are disciples of Christ are called to be people who restore relationships. How do we restore relationships among ourselves, within our families, within our communities? I've had the burden of counseling families who have inherited so much wealth but cannot put into practice because they do not relate one to another. And in case there's anybody out there who is in this situation, we have developed a tool which I first used when I was the navigators called relational healing of how can we come together as family members or community members to discuss our problems and understand one another so that we can utilize the resources God has given us. Because without harmonious relationships, there's no wealth creation. So if I was to conclude in terms of the purpose of business, now talking about business per se, as opposed to other professions in the marketplace, the purpose of business, according to Jeff Van Duza, is to serve. It is to serve the community by providing goods and services that enable the community to flourish. It is to serve its employees by providing them with opportunities to express at least a portion of their God-given identity through meaningful and creative work. So you need to define your business as how does it serve God's purposes as it's given to us in Genesis chapter one. Human beings made in God's image, given stewardship of God's creation, given gifts that can be expressed through a business or an employment opportunity so the society flourishes. Jeff and Dusa goes on to talk about profit. Because in Genesis, where we, the passage they began with, we're supposed to multiply. So hive up the employees and customers at the ends of the business, not the profit. The business is run for their welfare. But profit is not important as an end in itself. It is a means of attracting sufficient capital to allow the business to do what God has called it to do. So profit is what allows a business to fulfill its calling. It's not what drives a business. So all businesses must be profitable, must be run efficiently, must be run sustainably, so that the business can continue to serve its customers and its employees. And that is why businesses pursue profit, not as an end, but as a means to serving the employees and the customers and the community around them. Each time you hear the word Noah, would there be a Bible story of Noah without the ark? Very unlikely. Because God has, has your name, and against your name, he has an institution or a business or an organization that he has called you to. Beginning with your family, Noah and, put your name there. Why has God called you into that specific location? Is it not because he wants you to be a redemptive agent? He wants you to mitigate against the impact of sin and the, king, the God of this world who is out to destroy. Why has God placed you there? It's because he wants to make you not just be productive, producing goods and services, but also to build relationships with those around you so they may see something of God's righteousness and justice. And as I conclude this, I pray that each of you will begin to sense that you are called. All of us are called. We have different roles in God's calling. We are kingdom of priests. And those of us who are given titles and given special opportunities to equip the saints, may we repent of trying to position ourselves as being superior spiritually 
to those who are not reverends, those who are not in uh, vocation, those who are not apostles, those who are not prophets, those who are not Bible study group leaders, ministry leaders. We're not better than anybody else. All of us are called. And the success of our calling is when every saint is serving God's kingdom where God has placed them. And may God bless you as you consider your calling in the coming year. God bless you. Father, in Jesus' name, may you anoint us with the Holy Spirit like you did Bezalel and set us on fire where you've placed us so that we may serve your purposes, each playing the role for which you've set us apart. We bless you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, thank you so much uh, for that, um, Reverend Dennis Tongoy. I believe we have all been blessed by that. I know we have lots of questions. Um, so um, we can just either type them on the chat section or if you are not able to type, you can unmute your mic and ask any questions that you'd be having. So um, it's open for all of us. Thank you, Davis. I have a question. Reverend Togoy, uh, my name is Clive. Thank you for yesterday sharing and today. I think it's very insightful. My question is in regards to the aspect of culture in terms of uh, when it comes to business and prosperity. Uh, when you look at the Jews, there's something magical about them. There are very few in this world, but they seem to have found the magic formula in terms of uh, thriving in business, uh, innovation. If you look at uh, the, the Nobel Prize, they seem to be getting nearly a quarter of the, the, all the Nobel Prize given. So my question is, what is the, what is the, the role of culture uh, in making it in business? Thank you. Thank you, Clive, for that question and that observation, which very few people recognize. In fact, the Jewish nation, which God made to be a nation of priests, to actually to, to, to there as his witness to show the world what kind of God he is. Now, it's interesting because when you study the biblical economy, you'll find that the goal of the economy is not to make money, but to strengthen relationships. And the kingdom economy is built around relationships. The Jewish calendar had five feasts, each of them lasting almost one week. And during those feasts, they ate chapati and roast meat, but, uh, unleavened bread, and you know, uh, they fellowship together around food. And I, share, I mentioned this a little bit yesterday because Social capital is the foundation of every society. Relational capital is the foundation of every society. The Jewish Sabbath, one day a week, was a time when you ceased from working and reestablished your relationship with your creator and within with the family. So the foolishness of the rest of us is we have assumed that making money or pursuing money is what gives you wealth. And so we spend our time getting worn out and being working alone rather than building social capital. The other dimension is recognized that the tithe in the Old Testament was food. The tithe was not money. The tithe was food which you brought to one central place and ate together. And you gave some of the food to the priests to eat together, some of the food to the poor to eat together, and some of the food you ate together as, as a family. When I discovered this, I actually began to spend, before Corona came in, my wife and I would hold a, a, a monthly meeting of all our nephews and nieces who are in Nairobi to meet together regularly to eat our tithe. During that time, we're able to talk with each other, share ideas, and actually build our social capital. So what makes the Jews an amazing community is because they've learned how to build social capital. And social capital is what enhances creativity. And social capital is the foundation on, of every capital. So I think that's a very interesting thing to observe. But the goal of business or being the marketplace is not to make money, but it's to build community. And so we need to structure in our processes how we strengthen our relationships at work. Do we celebrate at work? Do we celebrate in the home, in the family? Do we have times of celebrations? Some people, when they see cultures that celebrate a lot, they think we're wasting money. But we're actually building capital. 
You say, why are you wasting that money? And of course, some cultures celebrate at death, some cultures celebrate at weddings, some cultures celebrate, but the central dynamic of kingdom economy is restored relationships. Uh, when do you know if God wants you to continue on, on missions or go back to your secular work? Now, first of all, let me talk about my taxi business. Once I had accomplished, I accomplished my goal of justice, I felt God told me the time was now to stop where I was because I also realized that without a lot of money, I would not fight the deep pockets of Uber. And I also realized that Uber was not in the taxi business. I was operating, I was fighting in the wrong business with them. They were in the data collection business. They were collecting data from your apps to sell to those who are developing the uh, uh, driverless cars. So they didn't care about the welfare of the driver. They only cared about the data that the drivers collected. So because I was not in the data management business, I was not competing with them. So I had to, to pull out because I did not have the resources to complete the data management business. So, but I'd achieved my goal by stopping them from exploiting our drivers here in Kenya. Now, somebody says, when do you know when it's time to stop uh, to, to, go, or to go on to missions or go back to secular employment. That is unbiblical language. It is dualistic language. All of us are called, but each of us have different roles at different times of our life. I have been called into ministry all my life, but does not mean I've not done business. In each season, God has given me a different way of engaging in his, in his, in his purpose for my life. But because of the secular spiritual divide I talked about yesterday, some of us consider missions and secular work. In God's economy, those two words don't exist. All work is God's work. Every profession anointed by the Spirit of God is to serve God's purpose. Every farmer, every teacher, every doctor is serving and advancing God's purpose because his purpose is not just to save souls, but also to renew the creation. His purpose is to see a flourishing earth that glorified him, where creation glorifies God and speaks of his, of his glory and honor. So we need to move away from the dualistic mindset. What we need to do is work with the Lord to recognize what season am I in and how is he calling me or opening and closing certain doors that position me to advance his kingdom. So your position either in the pit or in the palace or in Potiphar's house doesn't change your mission. You need to know what are your specific giftings as a person? What are your passions as a person? And how can God use those passions and giftings in that season of life in which you're at? Now, life has many seasons. I personally am in the season where I've married off all my children and I've buried all my parents. So I've got no other social luggage as it were. I'm free as a bird as it were. Some of you have got young children. You have to focus on those children. You can't take time away from them because God has entrusted them to you. You may have sick parents. You cannot say, what I've given to God, I've, I've, I've given to you, I've given to my parents. You must take care of your parents and honor them. So in each season, God calls us to love our neighbor. God calls us to serve those in need whom he has brought around us. And God will keep giving you different ideas of how to resource that need. How you find the ministry is not the same as the ministry God has called you to. God can call you to a ministry of children, and one day you'll find it through selling potatoes, next time through your job. But your passion for children does not change. My passion has been to help affirm business people and restore business people's calling to their lives. And to this end, I've changed my platform several times, but never the passion that God has called me to. And somebody has said, what is the difference between being rich and being wealthy? Now, that is a very good question because there is a difference between rich and wealthy. Wealthy has got to do with relational terms. You're living in harmony with the relationships that God has called you to. That is your family first, your community, your relationship to the material resources God has given you, and of course, above all else, to your God. Richness can sometimes be perceived in only one dimension, which is material. The how we use the words. So wealthiness is having material needs that have a clear purpose and end and where you're feeling you're, you're holistic in nature. Unfortunately, many families that gain uh, material wealth 
become rich, but not wealthy. In the process of becoming rich, you abandon your spouse, your children, and you exploit your community. And in the end, you, you have a lot of resources, but an empty heart and a cold environment. But those who are wealthy, in the process of creating that wealth, they bless many other people. They're generous in their giving to many other people. So I would say that our goal should be wealth creation, not just giving richness. Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and with man. He's blessing other people through ideas, blessing other people physically, spiritually. In somebody's uh, reason here, how does African culture celeb celebrate mostly? Um, again, let's be very be careful about celebration because sometimes the word culture, the root word for culture is the word cult, from which you get the word cultivate, from which you get the word culture. So when you are celebrating, be careful who you are cult, who you are worshiping. So in celebrating, do not be celebrating the demonic deities that are part of our communities or celebrating the other gods apart from God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The problem with us Christians is because we do not have a celebratory culture, we are forced to always be the ones joining other people's cultures to celebrate. I believe we need to redefine our cultures and create alternatives. I'll give you, I'll give you an example of a friend of mine here in Kenya. We know that circumcision rights are very important to many African communities. And in one part of Kenya, they, every two years, they circumcise over 10,000 people, young people. By doing that circumcision ceremony, they take them through one week of literally demonization by teaching them cultural practices where they learn to hate women and they learn to use witchcraft to get their power. What my friend did was bring in a redemptive alternative circumcision rites where they get the same young people, teach them biblical principles of being a man and circumcise them in a healthy environment. So he redeemed the cultural practice of circumcision. And the last I knew, his circumcision right had been able to get over five to 7,000 young people and only 3,000 remained in the traditional circumcision rites. Here's an example of how we come in and redeem a culture or a practice or a business that is being used by the devil to worship in another cult or another culture. So culture is not just about laughing and eating and drinking. Most culture has at its center a deity whom, who is being worshiped or honored or blessed. blessed. Then there's, a, there's having a biblical name and a few verses on the letterhead, make a business, missional or enterprise. Um, this is the worst form of blasphemy. It's the only thing that our names is what makes us Christians. When Daniel was sent to Babylon, his name was changed. He was given a pagan name. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were given pagan names. That did not make them less godly. So it is not in the names that we have. It's the God in whom we worship. And I'm totally sometimes disgusted if I use that term by Christians who assume that having a Christian name or verses that are part of our business, what makes us Christians? What makes us Christians is a reflection of God's kingdom, righteousness and justice, I shared yesterday, right relationships and equity. Because God, when, when in First Peter, he talks about a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness, means the, a, a, a place where the foundation of the new heaven and new earth is going to be founded on righteousness and justice. So if your business is not founded on righteousness and justice, don't think it's Christian just because you pray with your workers every morning or your Bible verses. What describes a Christian business is one where there's right relationships and justice. And let me say, right relationships is not perfect relationships. Right relationships is authentic relationships where we know how to resolve conflict in a mature manner. We know how to apologize to one another. We know how to disagree and come together in a mature way. We know how to relate to our, uh, to our, to our our um, business rivals without destroying them. It is not greed, but it is right relationships. So it is not the name of our businesses or the verses we have on the business model, but it is how we relate to one another in businesses. 
Then can you summarize what makes a business a mission enterprise? For me, a mission enterprise is one that has identified its, its redemptive purpose. What aspect of redemption in that industry is that business offering? How is that business positioning itself against the darkness around as light? It may be a business that refuses to play politics in a particular way. The other day I was on another video call this last week and a friend of mine from Ghana who runs a transport company was also a co-facilitator with me. And he shared about his business. His business is a transport business. And what he does in his business, he does not bribe the police. He does not use substandard uh, materials for his, for, for his, for, for his uh, uh, buses. He makes sure he uses genuine bread, brake pads. He does not overcharge in the season when transport is scarce. So he, be, he behaves very differently from everybody else because he's there as salt and light to mitigate against the greed that his fellow people in that industry have. So your presence there means that people have an alternative, an alternative and a benchmark to see what a kingdom business could look like. And that is mean to me what makes business visional. It is one that chooses to be counter business culture in terms of greed and actually positions itself to be righteous and just. And surprisingly, the cost of that kind of business can appear to be very, very uh, high in the beginning, but in the end, it will actually attract more people. There's a friend of mine when I lived in Eldred, those of you who are in the Navigator Ministry in Eldred, Kenya, will see, will realize Dr. Peter Agua's clinic that he had. When he came up to set that clinic, he set it up several kilometers outside the center of town. And people laughed at him and said, how are you going to attract customers if you're not even in town? Then he realized that most of his doctor friends were making most of their money through illicit, illegal abortions. And that's how they're building their, their economic empires. He refused to carry out abortions. Then he realized that doctors used to inject their, his, their, 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 their clients with water glucose, because most people believe there that unless a doctor has injected you, you're not going to be well. He refused to inject people just for the sake of charging them more money. If you did not need an injection, he did not inject you. Now initially, he appeared to be stupid and foolish. But afterwards, people realized that those who cheat for you will cheat you. They felt cheated by other people, and in the end, people would take that journey to go to his clinic because they knew he was a righteous and just person. And so with Christian businesses or big kingdom enterprises, when you seek to provide goods and services in a just and equitable way, it does not mean in a free way, but where you're covering your costs in such a way that you're, you're adding value. People will initially think you're foolish, but in the end, people prefer to go to a business where they know they're not being cheated or taken advantage of. May God allow you to encourage each other as you reflect on these truths. And my prayer for you is that the kingdom of God will come and God's will will be done in your life, on earth, in your context, as it is in heaven. Amen. Thank you.